And welcome again, Spartan Mac Live. It is Monday night in East Lansing, Jim Confronty Publisher, SpartanMac.com. Welcome in, grab a beverage, grab your thoughts, grab your opinions, let's talk. Go ahead and type your uh, questions there in the chat area at the SpartanMag.com YouTube channel. Give me a thumbs up on audio, let me know that we're okay, and we'll be ready to talk some Michigan State sports. Again, heading into another uh, bye week for Michigan State football, Michigan State basketball. Thanks, Old Tuck, appreciate that. Uh, basketball getting underway Tuesday in East Lansing, Michigan, the number one ranked Spartans of Michigan State taking on Albion in an exhibition. They'll, they will play Tuesday night, that's tomorrow night, as we are recording this live on YouTube. If you are getting this later in the week and the game's already been played, go to SpartanMag.com for all the coverage heading into next Tuesday's game against number two ranked Kentucky Wildcats, Madison Square Garden. I'll be there. Paul Conardike will be there. It'll be a lot of fun. Look forward to covering that one. So go ahead and put some questions up there. We will get to them. Michigan State, of course, coming off uh, another um, mostly dreadful performance against Penn State, losing 28-7, to getting behind the eight ball in a lot of ways. Uh, right off the bat in that game, problems, especially special teams, especially special teams, which hurt them when it was 13-0. Michigan State going down there, uh, maybe a chance to cut into that lead. Targeting foul goes against them, gets overturned. Kicking a field goal to cut it to 13-3 with, I think, two and a half minutes to go in the half. And, uh, you know, Michigan State, not only was the kick blocked, but they blocked it. Penn State didn't even have a field goal block on. They just rushed with about five. They had three or four guys playing linebacker, playing field goal safe because they were worried about a Michigan State fake field goal for good reason. James Franklin said that going into the game that they had to be prepared for that because last year when Michigan State beat Penn State, when Penn State was in the top 10, Michigan State faked a punt and had a halfback option and maybe one other fake play, a trick play of some sort. Not a lot of trick plays this year. Maybe you have to be better than that to uh, to get trick plays going. But anyway, the field goal's blocked. It was Mustafa Khalifa. I'm not sure what the problem was. This turnstile situation went right through him, blocked the field goal. Blocking the field goal is one thing. The big problem is they lost 19 yards back the other way. Penn State recovers at the 50-yard line. Now they've got a short field. A few plays later, 21-0, ball game. Special teams, the root of the problem there. And if Michigan State wants to turn it around this season and start playing better football, it has to happen on special teams and soon. You can't be blowing leaks on special teams if you've got such a small margin for error. You can't give up a, that type of margin there. Let's go... Uh, we will go to some questions. Let's go to the football questions. Not many basketball questions yet, but let's go to a basketball question first. Let's go to Bob from New York City. It says, any further word on Joey Hauser? You know, we covered, covered that today at the press conference. Izzo said, uh, no word. And there's some other questions about whether the, the question needs to be answered prior to the Albion game. No, he just can't play against Albion. He can't play until he's cleared. Izzo said today that there are, that it's his understanding there are like 59 or 60 players that are awaiting word from the NCAA about other transfer questions. So I don't know if they have to get back in line because the NCAA already within the last two or three weeks rejected Michigan State's um, case for Joey Hauser to have immediate eligibility. So now Michigan State's appealing. Do you have to go down to the bottom and wait for, wait for the other ones? I'm not sure. But, you know, Izzo did say something interesting today when he said he let slip. He said at, at one point uh, he thought, I can't remember his exact quote, but he said, I think he said it was a no-brainer. He said he's gone from it being a no-brainer to not thinking it was likely. Now he's somewhere in the middle. Back when he thought it was a no-brainer, he means it was a no-brainer that Hauser was going to get immediate eligibility. And that's right around the time that I heard about it, I didn't hear it from Izzo, but through other channels very close to Izzo, that it was a no-brainer, it was going to happen. They were preparing for the pre-practice season, expecting him to be a part of it, and that's when I put that color code out there on the Underground Bunker, actually on the final forum message board at SpartanMag.com, saying that it was a magenta alert, as opposed to an orange or a red or a yellow magenta. We didn't have a color for immediate eligibility to be granted, so kind of funny, but a lot of people didn't think it was funny. I took a lot of abuse for that, duly noted. I don't blame you for being mad about that, but anyway, that's why I, that's why I came up with the magenta. That was the, the straight, straight strong talk that uh, he was going to be back, but now 
People are asking me, where do I put it now in the confidence meter? I don't know. I can't predict the NCAA. I'm going to keep it right at 50-50 for right now. No color codes. I don't need any more of that. Learn my lesson. Now, I'll get to these. Uh, I have to get these. Uh, I have to get my my channel, my uh, screen straightened out here so I can look at some of the questions. We will stick with basketball for a moment. Michigan State going to start Rocket Watts at the two guard tomorrow. Rocket Watts, true freshman guard out of Detroit, originally from Old Redford. <clears throat> Old Redford in Detroit, senior year, Inspire Academy at uh, in Ohio. Question from Sparty Ricky. By the way, the first question, yeah, I said it was from Bar Bob from New York City. This one, Sparty Ricky didn't say where he was from. That's a foul, Sparty Ricky. That's a technical foul on you. If you're going to post a question at the final forum message board at SpartanMag.com, you got to say where you're from. But I'll let it slide this time because you had a good question. You said, hey, what can we expect? What can we hope from Rocket Watts since, uh, since he's going to be a key piece now with Josh Langford out? Question mark. Can he be as good as Gary Harris was his freshman year? Well, that's a good one. Different style of players. Can he be as good as Gary Harris? Different? Gary Harris was good. I mean, you're talking about a two-and-done NBA guy. That would be a lot for me to heap upon Rocket Watts, but I think Izzo said it best today, and he would know better than anybody. Rocket Watts has impressed them. Been a pleasant surprise across the board in every way since he got to campus. And he got to campus a little bit late uh, for various reasons. But physically strong kid, mature kid, effervescent kid, upbeat kid. In D'Antonio parlance, I think he's a giver. He's not a taker. He's a giver. And he's, I was there for the first practice, and he was doing a lot of passing that day. A lot of passing. Uh, you know, for a guy that scored 64 points last year against Lakewood St. Ed's, you can go on YouTube and watch those highlights. Um, a guy that can light it up. A guy that back in the AAU days would stop and pop from deep. He showed up at his new basketball college basketball team looking to distribute, and that was a great thing. Said a lot about his mind and his heart and where he wanted to be. That's just the tip of it. He's quick, runs that transition lane fast. You know, they used to call him Rocket Watts, and I was like, man, he's not that athletic, actually. Vertically, he, he jumps okay. And when he was like 15, 16, I'm like, man, people are going to get the wrong idea about him. Rocket Watts is not like he's Rocket Rod Foster. If you remember him from back UCLA in the 70s, early 80s maybe. 1980 with Kiki Vandaway, I think. Anyway, um, not lightning rocket fast when he's 15 or 16, but now that he's 18 or 19, freshman at Michigan State, and he does run exceptionally well. Still vertically not going to go up and dunk like Spud Webb or anything, but north and south within the Michigan State structure of the fast break is fitting in real well right there. Strong, physically strong with those feet. Should be able to play real good defense like Gary Harris did. With the mind and the heart and the attention to detail, should be a good defensive player in terms of physically being able to carry out what Izzo wants and then having the will and the seriousness to do it. And then others will get him into the film room to figure that stuff out. He can score, streak scorer, passes it real well. Here's the, diff here's the situation. I wanted to ask Izzo this today, but we kind of ran out of time for questions. They came into the year, I think, thinking that Rocket Watts was going to do a lot of backup point guard or at least compete with Foster Lawyer for backup point guard. Um, now with Langford out, because Langford was going to be a wing, Kyle Arns was going to be a wing, now Rocket Watts is starting at the wing, Gabe Brown's coming off the bench at the three. So with Watts, you know, he could still get those backup minutes, but if he's going to be running that wing like they want him to and playing defense like they want him to, he's going to have to sit a little bit, which means... He doesn't come off the bench to, to compete for the backup point guard job. So I think what that means, the dominoes fall, and Foster Lawyer's job as backup point guard, I think, is a little safer now. We will see what it looks like on Tuesday and the rest of the season going forward, but I think that's where the dominoes, one guy that was helped by this, I think was Foster Lawyer because his, I think he, he really needed to prove a lot to hang on to that position because there's going to be a lot of competition and a lot of talent there. Now, Langford out, Arns out for a little bit. We'll see what happens. Now let's go to a football question really quick here, and then I'll go to the YouTube questions. We've got from Cali Spartan. He says, what's the future of the quarterback situation at Michigan State going to be? And he says, Rocky ain't the man. I think a lot of people would agree with you about that with Rocky Lombardi. You know, did real well 
for a short period of time last year, filling in for Lewerke. By the end of the year, he was struggling. Heard that he had improved coming into this year. I think saw it a little bit if you were still watching the end of the Wisconsin game. Rocky Lombardi did some pretty good things at the end of that game to the point that I was like, you know what, he has improved a little bit. So I wanted to see him again, and we saw him again, all right? And it was not pretty. Now, uh, there's a lot of quarterbacks around the country or around the Midwest that did not throw the ball well on Saturday because not only was it raining like crazy, it was blowing like crazy. You saw, um, what's the guy at Notre Dame? Ian Book, is that his name? The quarterback, his numbers were like 8 out of 26. Now, Patterson threw it well, and Clifford was okay. Clifford's numbers were about the same as Lewerke's. But Clifford and Patterson for Michigan both had the advantage of being ahead by two or three touchdowns with a run game that was pretty good that could just suck you in with the run and then play action people wide open. So that was a different set of circumstances. Lewerke flat out said, yes, the, the weather, the wet ball was a factor. Rocky Lombardi has a smaller hand than other quarterbacks, so it might have affected him even more. He was grossly inaccurate. You saw that, right? Um, to me that with the, with the rain being what it was, it's kind of a, a spoiled specimen in terms of trying to evaluate how, how good or bad some people are. I'm not going to close the door on Rocky Lombardi just yet with, uh, Theo Day coming in. You know, it's interesting. He completed that pass on fourth down and then was, was taken out of the game. Theo Day did a few things halfway pretty good. So I thought that was somewhat encouraging, and he, he was uh, did some decent things in the spring game. Also, a lot of people were excited to watch Theo Day get on the field, see what he could do. Among them, Mark D'Antonio, but then he pulled them out. And uh, there were a lot of people on the underground bunker message board wondering, what the heck was that? You're putting Lewerke back in, then Lombardi? Seemed strange, right? Lombardi goes in, throws an interception. Lewerke comes in, fumbles a snap, and misses badly on a, on a tunnel screen and then on another pass. So... D'Antonio said that, you know, he was talking in code when he said that Lombardi, or that uh, Lewerke gave them the best chance to come back. And he wanted to see Lombardi to see if if he had it on that particular night, like putting a new pitcher in. Well, here's what happened. And Lewerke mentioned it, and we had it on SpartanMag.com after the game. Theo Day had an error with one of the play calls. If you go back and look at it, it was the third and two situation before the fourth and two conversion. It's third down and two. They're running like a zone read. I think Anthony Williams was the running back. And it, it, it's like he was waiting for Anthony Williams to clear and he was going to run a zone read. I don't know what he was supposed to do. Whatever Theo Day did, it was not the play call. And they got jumbled up in the backfield there. The quarterback was wrong. If you go back and watch the game, if you have the stomach for it, you will see that D'Antonio was snarling pretty bad after that. Might have even said a bad word. He doesn't do that very often, but he might have said a bad word. Um, so by the time he figured out what was going on, it was fourth and two, left him in there, picked it up, and then took him out. Reason being, if you're a quarterback and you're going into the game and you and a play call goes in and you don't know the play call and you operate it wrong, you're coming out. I can't argue with that. I wanted to see more from Theo Day. You wanted to see more from Theo Day. Theo Day wanted to see more from Theo Day. Theo Day's mother wanted to see more from Theo Day. But one of the points we're going to talk about today is a problem with quality control at Michigan State, especially on defense. Quality control and special teams. There's cracks. There's loose wheels. There's loose screws. I've been saying it since week number two. They need to tighten up the loose screws. They haven't gotten tightened. So the only way that the coaches probably know how to tighten those up is to hold people accountable. So what was he doing? He was holding Theo Day accountable. You finally get a chance to make your college football debut, and you don't know the, <clears throat> the play call to run it. Quality control. Hold him accountable. Coming out. Like Nick Saban used to say, if you're, if you're just letting it happen, then it's your fault. Or what is it? If you're not coaching it, you're just letting it happen. So he's not going to just let it happen. It happened once, got a chance, coming out. In the end... Does it make him sharper and more prepared for the next game? You bet it will. But as of now, October 28th, 29th, 30th, going into the first week of November, we don't know as much about Theo Day as we would have if he had been able to stay in there. So I understand it, and that was frustrating. Let's go to the questions over here at the YouTube uh, area, the chat area. Go ahead and post them if you got some questions. 
we will get into it. Now, I apologize that I take a drink of water once in a while or coffee or whatever this is. I'm not going to tell you what it is. But that's the difference between this show and other shows. We don't have a commercial break. I don't have a guest host. Usually a guest host would talk and I'd get some water or something. Or a caller would come in. Maybe we'll do that someday. We'll take calls. Maybe we'll do it that way so that you don't have to sit there and watch me drink water. Apologize for that. Good to see Old Tuck here and Stu Redmond. Rob South back in action. Nobody's tardy. It's good. Bob Barmack is back. That was the guy from New York City chiming in. Bob, how you doing? Bob, Bob's all right. He's all right with me. Bob's controversial over there on the Final Four message board. But it's just basketball, right? Todd H., I think our only chance is to make a quarterback change. Why not get younger guys experience for next year? Not yet, Todd. Not yet. He says, I think our only chance. Your only chance for what? Your only chance to improve for next year? Yes. Your only chance to finish out 4-8 and eight and have a complete train wreck? Yes. No, stick it out with Lewerke. I want to see him in some dry conditions. I mean, he was messed up in the head against Wisconsin, and I understand that. He made some passes against Ohio State going back. I mean, Herb Street was talking about it. Some touch passes on third down, high-level passes. You've seen him do it before. He took such a beating in the fourth quarter at Ohio State, carried over to the Wisconsin game, did not trust his receivers, did not trust the offensive line. He had happy feet from the first snap of the game. He says, he admits he didn't see the field well that day. That was, that was, that was dreadful, but he's better than that. I wanted to see him against another good defense, Penn State, after a week off. And then you get those conditions. It's the same for everybody, but those aren't the conditions to give us an idea if the offense is gaining any traction. It's really unfortunate. So, um, no, I wouldn't. I don't agree. You can have your opinion. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I want to. I think you got to beat Illinois, and the best way to beat Illinois is with Lewerke right now. So. All right, here we go. Stu Redman, seems like quality control issues are still hurting this team. That's what I was talking about. Missed assignments, poor blocking by wide receivers and tight ends, gap coverage issues on defense. What's going on? My man, I do not know. You're exactly right. Defense, so the latest errors. Okay, Josh Butler gets beat on the touchdown, 7-0. Michigan State's in cover two. He's in perfect position to play the ball or get an interception. Doesn't either. Touchdown, 7-0. Next time Michigan State was on defense, Josh Butler's not out there. Shakur Brown is. So that tells you all you need to know about what they thought of Josh Butler on that, on that play. Everybody loves Josh Butler. Everybody loves his dogs. He's a good guy. Everybody rooting for him. But um, last year he was hurt half the year. Prior to that, he was a part-time player. Coming into the year, I wanted to see what does Josh Butler have. I thought he was a big X factor, a big variable for this team this season. And he's been okay. He's a good tackler. They could have used his tackling ability on the one that got away for 60 yards against Ohio State when Kalen Gervin missed the tackle down the right sideline. He's okay, but in terms of having the Michigan State standard as a starting corner, he's not there. And he's a senior, fifth-year senior. You know, he's not going to get there. So... He is what he is. He's doing his best. Salute him. That's great. That wasn't necessarily quality control. That was technique. Played it incorrectly, right? Second touchdown. Joe Bocci was talking about it. He was very frustrated about it. He called the play a Y pop, and I wrote about it. You know, the wide receiver, the Y tight end goes out. A little pop pass. They, the window dressing is pulling the guard, faking power, dropping back. Bocce said they saw it on film. They knew it was coming. Tyreek Thompson, who's had a good year. Tyreek Thompson, not the fastest guy, but he's playing faster than, than he used to. He's good, solid. He, you can play it. You can win a lot of games with Tyreek Thompson if everything else around him is good and the offense is good. You can win with him. He's a, he's a keeper. And he's good defeating blocks without giving up space, defeating blocks without getting, with, and being firm and log jamming that thing and bouncing plays. He's good at it. This particular play, tight end pop. I don't know if he's supposed to reroute or drop with him or whatever. He bites on the run, gets behind him, touchdown. And then Xavier Henderson, who had a good game tackling otherwise, got him at the four-yard line, went for a strip, didn't get it, touchdown. I don't know I don't know if he would have gotten that big guy down either anyway. Xavier's a good tackler. I think he probably would have. But Michigan State, it's like they've emphasized turnovers so much that they've gotten away from some tackling fundamentals, especially in the Ohio State game. So, I mean, get to wrap them up there at the two or the three. Michigan State's been pretty good on first or second down inside the three-yard line, stopping people, make them go to third down, make them go to the air. 
Maybe you get a, a, a false start. Maybe you get a holding, back them back there, whatever. Live to play another day. Instead, they're going for the strip, just like Joe Bocci did on a play against Ohio State. They've never done that before. I know they've emphasized turnovers more, but there's got to be a point of diminishing returns on putting so much into that. So that was quality control. Tyreek Thompson, a good player, a good dependable player. Let's that one get behind him. Quality control. There's been a lot of them. 3 nothing against Ohio State. 60-yard touchdown to Benjamin Victor. Remember that one? Fields comes out, and B- Benjamin's wide open down the sideline. Kalen Gervin misses the tackle. Well, David Dowell on the on the fake action, Fields elongating the play, thinks the quarterback's keeping it. He plays the run, comes up. Antoine Simmons was right there. Don't try to do Antoine Simmons' job. It was a look that they hadn't seen, I, su- I assume, but he let the receiver get behind him. Quality control. Didn't play his coverage. Field goal protection. Break it down. So what's the problem? I mean, I can sit in here and identify him. D'Antonio identified him uh, after the Ohio State game all week getting ready for the Wisconsin game, telling the guys, hey, these are the things that you solve these and we don't beat ourselves on these plays. Make them beat us. And we're right in that game against arguably the best team in the country. He showed it to him. Everybody believed it. Went out to Wisconsin. They were worn down. Had a week off. Everybody believed it. Came out against Penn State. They're dropping a punt. You know, I, the nearest thing, I, if I'm not a sports psychologist, but I did sleep at a Holiday Inn when we were at um, Wisconsin a few weeks ago. And I can tell you that teams that I've watched, when things start to go south a little bit, people try to do too much. And then, then the, the wheels, get, that's when wheels get loose. So a lot of times I think those things compound and snowball on a team that's inherently not that good. Then people try to step out of their lane to do someone else's job. Saw Antoine Simmons do that on a 30-yarder, on that like 25-yard run that Penn State had. Half of it was called back because of holding, and Simmons got out of his gap on that one. Simmons got out of his gap also on the 30-yarder by Master Teague for Ohio State. You know, just no on that one he didn't get there in time. That was just a good play. That was no one's fault. That he had he was in a run-pass conflict because he had two receivers over here. He had the B gap. And uh, he, get, he gets to the B gap, but the left tackle gets enough of him that he can't make the tackle. Master Teague's not the easiest guy to tackle, so not that one. Antoine Simmons has had a good year, but there's a couple times when he's tried to jump out of his assignment thinking the ball's going there, and then it comes back to where he was supposed to be. They've all been a little bit guilty of that, so quality control. If they don't get that fixed, and that, that was, that's been the backbone of what they've been over the years, and it's allowed them to play better and win better than their than their uh, talent should allow them to. Now they're winning less than their talent should allow them to. That's not that's not good grammar. So that's a quality control issue on my part. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, Arizona State game. You're you're a better team than Arizona State. You're proving it for for 58 minutes. Fourth and 13, two or three guys. Yeah, they rushed three and eight drop. Some of them dropped too much. And then on the third down play, someone lost containment. Can't remember who it was. Over on the right side. It was another third down. They got him down inside the three-yard line. And there was a big drop inside the 10-yard line before one of them missed field goals when C.J. Hayes ran it too much into a safety. Quality control. And then the missed field goals, of course. And in that situation, you lose to a team. You're better than Arizona State, and you lose the game. Exhibit. Exhibit ASU, and that game continues to haunt them. If you're five and three right now with those three losses to top ten teams, a little bit easier to stomach at this point. But quality control up and down the dial. What do we have here? Spartans forever says. What kind of candy does the Comproni family hand out at Halloween, and am I dressing up? Well, I'll tell you what. I saw the bag up there that Mrs. Comperoni bought, and it was it was a, a mixture. It was a it was a, it was a cornucopia of candy. Okay, but it's your basics. It's your basics. Um, peanut free. You know, you got your Twixes. You got your Kit Kats. You got your Take Five, which is the most underrated candy bar in the history of mankind. Okay. So it's it's a good mixture going on there. 
uh, this is the first year that our kids are not going to be, that we're not going to be going out to kids. Kids are going to their friends because we're not cool anymore. So we're going to be here. I don't know. We'll run a movie and give out candy. I kind of thought about getting a chimney going, throw a couple logs in there, maybe get some coffee, get some hot chocolate for anybody that wants some of that. Get out there in the deck and do some of that. But I don't think I'm going to do that. I mentioned that. And the missus said, nah, I don't know. That's what my mom used to do. Used to do hot chocolate out on the porch. Used to be a big hit. But that's it seems like back then there were more kids trick-or-treating. Depends on the neighborhood, I guess. I digress. Let's see. But don't send me any take fives, though, because I can't eat take fives anymore. I've given up gluten, which has been a good decision. But And, and I miss I miss take fives. Let's see. Predictions for the NFL season. I don't have any multi-apples. Don't have any. Old Tuck. Out of Austin, Texas. Via Ludington. And uh, let me check the... Sorry, I, got, I still have Lake Michigan number two on, on my power rank, my Great Lakes power ranking. Sorry about that, Old Tuck. Keep Austin weird for us, though, Old Tuck. Keep Austin weird. And let me know if you miss the Great Lakes down there at all. Let's see. Do you think D'Antonio could learn something? I lost it here. Do you think D'Antonio could learn something from Mac Brown and Les Miles, who are similar in age, by hiring younger coaches and better recru- recruiters? A lesson they um, learned the hard way. Yes. Wouldn't surprise me if they went in that direction. You know, they brought in Treadwell among other things, to solidify things after that crazy 2016 Rocky situation. You were able to hire another assistant coach. Michigan State went older instead of younger. And they put Treadwell in charge of coaching the incoming freshmen. Remember, the problems that happened, um, a lot of the problems have happened have been freshmen. So trying to keep an eye on the freshmen, mentor them, when maybe the head coach doesn't have as much time to, to focus on the freshmen as much as their first year in college progresses. So I can see that thinking. Um, Treadwell, uh, he's been a decent recruiter in the past. I don't know where he is as a recruiter right now. We're still trying to get a handle on that. But these are confidence, confidants of D'Antonio. So is Bowman. Would not surprise me someday. You know, Bowman, there's been talk about retirement and stuff, and at some age, sometime, everybody retires. It wouldn't surprise me if, if Bowman retires, stays in town, moves upstairs, becomes an analyst because he's very valuable. His X's and O's knowledge about everything, about how to attack a defense with a run game if you've got the players. So in Treadwell, I could see him doing that too. So is that one way to do it? Get younger, those guys become analysts. I understand there's more money coming in. They can invest that that way. So, uh, hey, Mac Brown, you're, there's no question. I mean, Mac Brown and, and Miles have done, have done a good job, and that surprised a lot of people. The dude at Arizona State surprised a lot of people. Older guys. Can that happen at Michigan State again? Interesting question. We'll get into more of that. Let's see, Jesse Adams from Mount Pleasant. Uh, can we be honest with ourselves as Michigan State fans? This offensive coaching isn't good. They can't make the adjustments and can't develop guys. Does Mark D'Antonio actually fire some people now? I guess that goes along the lines of what I was just talking about. Uh, I think there's a chance of that happening, yes. I think there's a chance of that happening. On the offense, um, you're right. Not good against Penn State, Wisconsin, Ohio State. Good good against Ohio State for part of it. But like D'Antonio likes to say, let it play out. Let it play out. I know a lot of people are like, they don't need to see anymore. It's not good. True, the receivers, like we said, are not up to the Michigan State standard. Can see that. Offensive line, as spotty as it's been, it's better than it was last year. And it's it's got a pulse. You're seeing a few things. Um, I want to see them on a dry track. We'll see. If they score nine points against Illinois, we'll come back. We'll talk some more. Let's go to the defense, or let's go to another mailbag question from that was posted at the Underground Bunker message board. Let's see. MSU Polo from Rockford. Why is the defense struggling with the same pieces as last year? Um, Struggling. They're losing, but it might surprise some people to see that Michigan State is ranked number 23 in the nation in total defense. Michigan State's number 23 in the nation in total defense. 
I, you know, I thought Michigan State basically gave up 21 points to Penn State. The, the, the Sowards fumble is not on the defense. They gave up 21. They got a short field off the block field goal. Thanks a lot, special teams. Short field. Still need to stop them there, but you could argue 17 to 21. Last year at Penn State, Michigan State gave up 17 points. Um, this year, Penn State got about, what, 302 yards? Last year, Penn State had 397 against Michigan State. Michigan State wins the game, so you don't remember what the defense did. Defense was, was better that day, but a lot of the numbers are similar to last year. It's just the numbers will come back down to earth, theoretically, if they can shut down Illinois, Maryland, and Rutgers. We'll see what happens with Michigan. Last year, Michigan was a very tight rivalry game. If it's like that again, Michigan State's numbers will go down defensively more, I would assume. But, uh, you know, think about the beginning of the Ohio State game when Michigan State turned it over twice. Michigan State had defensive stand, missed field goal, defensive stand, field goal. Remember that? I mean, that was good defense Michigan State was playing. Not enough depth in some ways. And then you get into the quality control issues, whether it's David Dowell on that error that makes it 10 to nothing, or Joe Bocci not getting to his gap on the Dobbins long run for a touchdown against Ohio State. There was a key scramble when it was 10 to 7. Fields got out, scrambled for about 30 yards, went ahead and scored a touchdown to make it 17 7. But that was a key play. And Mike Panashuk, who's had a good year, was better this week, was worn down against Wisconsin. On a pass rush, he got out of his lane, Fields gets loose and uh, gets a 30-yarder. Panashuk usually does not play a lot on third downs, nickel situations. But Ohio State, quick snap, Panashuk, quality control, gets out of his pass rush lane, 30-yard gain, gets out. Those little plays like that. Uh, you know. But when you watch Michigan State be that tough in the early going against Ohio State, you can see that there's a good defense in there. Now, Willekes is not as dominant as he was last year for whatever reason. Bocce, still bocce, not perfect, but pretty good. Tyree Thompson's good enough. Antoine Simmons has been good, but the quality control. Jacob Panishuk's been better. Raekwon Williams has been good. Josiah Scott's been excellent. I know that he got beat on the one little shake move by Hamler on that third and medium, but Hamler one-on-one -on -one in space. I mean, there's there's guys in the NFL that would not be able to stay with him on that. He is, he's otherworldly quick, but Josiah Scott's been good, tackling good. And the two times that they went deep with Hamler, Josiah Scott ran right with him, stacked him. That was great coverage. He went up on the draft boards running with Hamler on those two plays. He could run. I didn't know, you know, we knew Josiah Scott was good. I didn't know he could run like that. And the one time against Ohio State when Dobbins got out, Josiah Scott caught him, went for the strip, didn't get it. But the speed, straight line speed from him, Josiah Scott pretty good in that area. You know, last year, against Indiana, you know, you look at Indiana this year and say Michigan State gave up 356 yards and looked terrible. Well, they gave up 301 last year to Indiana. So they're losing games, so it seems worse. I know they were losing games last year too, but like I said, number 23 in the country, um, maybe not as bad as you think it is, but they can get better, no question. They are not the dominant top 10 defense like Penn State is, like Michigan is like Ohio State is, like Iowa is, like Wisconsin is. Michigan State should be in there like that, right? And if the quality control were tighter, they would be. So although Willekes is not what you thought he would be, and you still have those problems at corner, they could, and even Dowell getting a little bit shaky sometimes, you could still be a top 10 defense despite all those things, in my opinion. What do we have here? Uh, Hayden V8 from Grand Rapids. With the outcome of the game on Saturday, there's no escape from the questions, especially with all the murmurs around the stadium. You know what he's talking about. Jim, what is your gut feel on Coach D'Antonio after the season? And what can this mean for our current commitments and future? Well, um, my gut feel is... Um, I think D'Antonio is going to plant his post foot and move forward. I, I think there's the competitor in him wants to do that. And, you know, people talking about predicting he's going to retire. That could happen. But I guarantee you that in August and September, he had no plans of retiring. The main thing that would cause him to think about retiring 
has been the public reaction. And I don't know how much of that gets into his bubble or into his wife's Becky's bubble if she knows about it. But that's enough to make you say, forget it. Because next year is going to be difficult. Next year, they're losing a lot of players. That schedule is difficult. You know, maybe they can get it back together and, and have a good season next year. But there's going to be strain next year. Do you want to, do you want to go through that? And, you know, I was on the huge show today, and I said something, and I, and I said something on the bunker, too, about um, if, if D'Antonio were my dad, what I would advise him to do. Now... I would, I would advise him, you know, because he's got the contract running. You know, he, he gets, like, a big big bonus if he stays through, you know, February 10th or whatever it is. Um, I would advise him to just take the money and say, you know what, it's been fun. Sayonara. It's been a lot of fun. Even if they won, even if they beat Michigan, especially if they beat Michigan. But, you know, that's me. I'm spiteful. But especially if they beat Michigan and they win a bowl game and they go 10-4, and four, then definitely leave. And then you put in that Bob Knight quote where you bury me upside down so my critics can kiss my you-know-what. That's what I would do. But I'm more vindictive than D'Antonio. D'Antonio is more presidential than I am. He's, uh, he's more diplomatic. He's more understanding. He's more competitive, too. So... He's going to look at it as a competitor and say, I'm going to get this straightened out. We're going to get, maybe they do bring in new coaches. Maybe that makes a difference. Maybe he thinks that there's things you can fix there. I don't know. But my gut feel is um, it's going to be his decision because there's nobody that I can see at the administrative level or at the board of trustees level. I don't see anything simmering like there used to be in the old days. <clears throat> Excuse my language. You know, simmering around <clears throat> trying to make moves to get him out or to get other people out. I don't, I'm not seeing that. And it should be his decision. With all that he's won at Michigan State, he should have the right of first refusal. And that, could, that might make some people angry. But it shouldn't for all he's done. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and bring in somebody that you think might win at Michigan State when you've got someone here who already has won at Michigan State that knows more about that subject than anybody on the planet. I mean, there's... <clears throat> There's one person that's, <clears throat> I got the wrong type of drink here. There's one person on the planet that's won at Michigan State at this level. One living human being. It's not Nick Saban. It's not George Perlis. It's Mark D'Antonio. Now, um, in terms of knowing what needs to be done to win at Michigan State, he knows it. Now, you don't want to bring, you don't want to hold on to someone too long. I understand that. Hayden Fry, you don't want that to happen. But, um, Getting back to the point about Mac Brown and uh, Les Miles, that'd be an interesting way to go if you change things up with some of the staff. I don't know if that'd be the fix or not, um, but I'm not here saying that that I, 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 you know what I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm saying I could I could see why it should be his decision, but if I were him. I don't know if I would need the, all the strain of next year. I don't know if I would need that. And people say it can hurt his legacy. And yeah, if next year, if they go six and six this year and go five and seven next year, yeah, it, it would uh, be a tough way to go uh, for things to come to an end if, if it doesn't go beyond there. I'm not sure. But um, that's why the vindictive side of me would be like, hey, just if I were him or he, if he were my dad, I'd say, man, just tell everybody to kiss off. But he's a competitor. He's one. He's going to want to win with his guys. He's going to want to regroup, cut some fat, and get back after it. He came into this year genuinely thinking they were going to make a run of the big, get a surprise people, make a run of the Big Ten East Championship. Things haven't bounced that way. Tough schedule, tough road games. Not that they would have beaten those teams at home anyway. But um, he still knows a lot. Okay. He knows more than all of us about what's needed to win here, and it's not easy to win here. If you look at his record, it's kind of similar to the end of the Philip Fulmer years at Tennessee. In some ways, similar to the end of the Lloyd Carr years in terms of percentage of the drop-off. Similar to the end Jimbo Fisher so at Florida State. So you can, you can move Jimbo Fisher out and go hire Willie Taggart you can move 
Lloyd Carr out and go get Rich Rodriguez and Brady Hoke. You can move Philip Fulmer out. And let's just put Philip Fulmer in charge of Michigan State. Let him hire the next four coaches at Michigan State. Now, a lot of people will say, you bring in a, a good coach or another coach, There's a, that's how you fix it. That's the way to get better. Um, it can also go off the deep end real bad. Now, a lot of people are like, well, you can't run a business like that. You can't worry about what negatively, what might not happen. you got to fix what's not working. I understand that also. The thing is, you're four and four. Um I made this point in the message board. When they were, you know, in year three, when D'Antonio began with a one and three record and lost to Central Michigan, there was a lot more patience back then. There, there was no hot seat back then. He was one and three and lost to Central Michigan, and people were like, okay, let's wait. Um, Lovey Smith at Illinois, they beat Wisconsin, they beat Purdue, they're four and four. They're about ready to have a Purdue, they're about ready to have a parade for that guy. They're going to beat Rutgers. They'll come in at 5-4. and four. They're going to have a parade for that guy. D'Antonio's 4-4. Four and four. They want to get rid of him. That's a guy with, what, seven, ten-win seasons? 4-4. Four and four. Get rid of him. Have a parade for Lovey Smith. Ten years ago, the, the D'Antonio that was 1-3, and three, no heat. 4-4 four and four now? Get rid of him, some people say. The old saying about a victim of your own success, I know people look at his age, they look at recruiting, they look at the, the product on the field, they look at a lot of seniors moving on, they don't see any hope for next year. So I understand why people are looking at it that way. you got to understand, you guys, uh, in some ways I'm out of touch with a lot of you guys because you guys are real emotional about this. I try to be clinical about it and unemotional if I can. So that's the way I see it. And in terms of the way we're all arguing about it on the talk shows and on the message boards, there's no, you know, like I said on the message board today, it doesn't, there's nothing that can be done today here on October 28th, 29th, 30th. There's no decisions that we make. I don't have a vote. You don't have a vote. It's not like we have to decide by Thursday what we're going to do and have an argument and stamp it out. There's no stamping it out. It's not, not up to us. If you feel one way and another person feels another, it doesn't really matter. And if you can't talk the other guy into, into agreeing with you, it makes no difference. If, if, if this were politics, if you were board members and you wanted to talk him into it, it would make a difference. There's no difference. If you can't talk somebody into uh, to agreeing with you, I don't know why people get mad about it. But it's probably good for the message board. Or maybe it's not good for the message board. I don't know. But I want to see the Illinois game. Illinois has been playing well. We'll talk more about it next week. But I'm expecting Michigan State, if they get a dry track, Illinois is pretty good, believe it or not. When they beat Wisconsin, they were doing some things on defense that were tricky. They're firm and tricky. The last interception, when they intercepted Cone on that third and five, they dropped a guy into Cloud, and uh, they're doing some NFL Lovey Smith stuff and doing it pretty well, and they're solid. I expect Michigan State to beat them. I expect Michigan State to be the better team, come out, just take care of business, and beat them. And I expect Michigan State to play tough against, with, against Michigan. So we'll see. And then after those two games, we'll, come, we'll all come back here, get some beverages. We'll talk about it. Some more. Let's go to the YouTube questions here. That doesn't mean I'm right. That's just what that's that's just the way I see things. Um, Stu Redmond. Does D'Antonio hold quarterbacks to a higher standard than other positions? Seems like he was a little hard on day when other guys were making equally as bad mistakes. Good question. Good point. Fair point. I don't know if he does or not, but on that occasion he did. Old Tuck says, I think Mark D'Antonio would rather retire than introduce a new offensive coaching staff into the program. He said as much last spring. That's a good point. You know, when you're getting when you're getting to the end of the rope, and he didn't think he was at the end of the rope in August, but at some point we all, we all have to retire, right? And if he's thinking exit strategy, there's probably nothing in his exit strategy that includes firing three or four guys. He's never been that way. Doesn't want to do it. Um, thinks he can win with those guys. You know, it's his it's head it's his head on the line, and he's expecting to win. He wants to win, and he genuinely thought. He had a better chance to win with these guys than going out and bringing someone else in. Other people might think you're crazy, but he knows, again, he knows better than we do. And if he thought he had something there, whatever. But when George Perlis was fired, one of the things he said was, I'm very proud of the fact that I never fired an assistant coach. I mean, these guys have to look in the mirror the rest of their lives. So some people would say he's being too loyal uh, to a fault. That might be true. Now, Perlis did demote some people. He demoted Norm Parker from defensive coordinator to linebackers coach, brought in Henry Bulla in 1994 for one year. They employed the 3-4 defense. 
they went under 500. He was fired. But Larry Belot, they moved him upstairs to an athletic department position, did some radio, did some color commentary, brought in Skip Pete as a wide receivers coach. But, uh, again, didn't fire B-Lot, didn't fire um, anyone else, and he was proud of that. To a fault, maybe. Same thing can happen to D'Antonio. Uh, he's not going to get fired. He'll, I mean, no, you know, not this year. It'll be his decision. Because the new president, Stanley, I don't, I don't know. I don't know a lot about him, but I don't see him coming in and, and breaking it and making it his. Because is the athletic director, Beekman, is he a guy that can go put together a coaching search? I'm not sure. When Beekman was hired as athletic director, he was basically hired by D'Antonio and Izzo. They okayed it, officially or unofficially. He passed the smell test for those guys. So Beekman is an administrator, but I don't think he's like um, the type of... Uh, maybe he will grow to become that, but in terms of setting out to hire a head football coach, um, maybe you, you outsource that to a search committee. I'm not sure, but he's trained in a lot of ways, but I'm not sure he's in a hurry to do that, firstly. Secondly, maybe to a fault again. Secondly, again, I think D'Antonio has earned the latitude to make his decision this year and going into next year, for sure. I completely believe that. Now, like I said, would I advise him as he makes his own decision to just thumb his nose and say, I'm done, I'm out of here, this place is crazy, I'm done. I might advise him to do that. As an administrator, would I push him out? No way. No way. You give him the chance to, to uh, he's earned his chance to, to uh, try to finish this this year and get into next year. I don't know if he'll be next year. Maybe he'll, maybe he will step down. But you know what? No one knows. He's not going to tell anybody. The only people that have any idea are Mark D'Antonio and Mrs. D'Antonio. He doesn't have an agent. He's not going to be telling people at, at the Capitol Grill. Anybody who says they know that he's, that he's moving on and it's been that way all along, they're full of crap. Because in September and August, there was no way D'Antonio was planning to retire. Anyone who, th who says that, hey, a broken clock is correct two times a day. Two times a day. So anyone that thinks they have inside information that D'Antonio is leaving, even if he does end up leaving, there was no inside information on it in September. Believe me on that. What do we have here? Um, let's see. Old Tuck, I think, Mark, let's see. Noah Conley, Rocky is always inaccurate. He has like a career 40% completion percentage. You're right about that. Theo Day looks a lot better with just three throws. Can't argue with that. Noah Conley, my question is, can Michigan State beat Michigan this year and can, can they score more than 10 points? Can they? Yeah, they can. We'll see what Michigan State looks like after Illinois. We'll see how Michigan deals with some of the success now. Jack Evelyn today asked me during, you know, after the press conference, we we're sitting around talking confidence meter. Where's my confidence meter on Michigan? How surprised would I be if Michigan State beat Michigan? 10 being like super stunned. I put it at seven right now. I put it at seven. And like he said, I've seen worse Michigan State teams beat better Michigan teams than what we will see this year. At this point, I mean, if they'd have played Saturday night, Michigan State would have steamrolled. I mean, Michigan would have steamrolled them. We all know that. But, I mean, if Michigan played Wisconsin again, that would be different. Um, things change quick in college football. Teams change. So, they can beat Michigan State. Or Michigan State can beat Michigan. I'm not predicting it, but it can, it can happen. We'll learn more here in the next couple weeks. Doors Fan 91 feels like things are bad behind the scenes. Lack of trust. Doors Fan says, bottom line, does this staff need to go as things are beyond repair, as Mike V says? I just went through a little bit of that. Beyond repair? Um, beyond repair? I mean, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a colloquialism. Beyond repair. I mean, Josh Butler, the touchdown he gave up, you can repair that. The mistake Tyreek Thompson made, you can repair that. The mistake on the field goal block, you can repair that. Brandon Sowers on the field goal punt, you can repair that. Um, Lewerke, he can be better than that. Tough situation for him. Run game is not operating against the defense that leads the nation in yards allowed per rush. So you got to throw it. Not great conditions for him to throw. Not great conditions for anybody. But you can do better than that. Wide receivers are not great. 
Trey Mosley was a breath of fresh air. Uh, beyond disrepair or what that, whatever that is, I disagree with that. Greg Barcelo, not going to put comp on the spot to speculate, but I feel the quality control issue on offense stemmed from the demoted coaches not buying in. Interesting point, not buying in. That would mean Terry Samuel, Mark Staten. I mean, Staten is tight ends coach. He's trying. I don't know. Uh, offense not performing. Defense going out there and playing hero ball. Hero ball is a good way to say it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Doors fan, 100 grand is the most underrated candy bar in my opinion. I think 100 grand is properly rated because back in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of commercials about the hundred Nestle's hundred thousand dollar bar. Remember those commercials with the slow motion, all that. Whenever you have that many commercials for a candy bar, that means you're a highly rated candy bar. They're putting money behind the product. So I think hundred grand is properly rated. When's the time you've, you? When's the last time you saw a Take Five candy bar commercial? Take Five. You ain't seen one, have you? Underrated candy bar. Noah Conley, fire everyone on the offensive staff on the offensive side, and get a good new quarterback coach and offensive coordinator. Keep Mark and defensive coaches. Duly noted. Charles Eastman, any word on the Noah Kim, on, on, the, on Noah Kim and who came to uh, Michigan State this weekend? Um, this just jumped on me a little bit. On him choosing Michigan State from Charles Eastman about Noah Kim. Noah Kim, quarterback from Chantilly, Virginia was committed to Virginia Tech, decommitted after he got the Michigan State offer last Sunday. I did speak with Noah Kim about two hours ago on the phone. He just got off the practice field, and he loved his visit. His parents were here. They met with D'Antonio in the office after his official visit. He got to see a little bit more of, of dorm life and the life of a player at Michigan State, and that all strengthened his thoughts on Michigan State. He camped at Michigan State as a freshman and a sophomore. His basketball coach in Chantilly, Virginia, is Coach D'Antonio. I think it's John D'Antonio. Mark D'Antonio's younger brother. D'Antonio's younger brother is his basketball coach. So he's been hearing about Michigan State since he was in ninth grade. Won a state championship as a sophomore at quarterback. He was on a state championship team as a backup quarterback as a freshman. On their way to a state championship last year, probably broke his femur in the semifinals, and they lost. Now they're undefeated again on the March Tour to possible state championship again. He's feeling good. Uh, you know, 6'2", quick release guy, touch, zip. Michigan State likes, they like his head. They like his quickness in the pocket. In terms of quickness in the pocket, and no, 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 I've said this before, but don't take this wrong. Don't take this wrong. But his quickness in the pocket reminds me a little bit of Tate Forcier. Remember Tate Forcier at Michigan? I know he struggled at Michigan in some ways. Had some good moments too. Transferred out, never heard from him again after his sophomore year. But Kim is like a littler guy that gets his feet set. Be an interesting guy to add to the talent pool. I asked him if, if he's going to be visiting other any other schools, and he says, as of now, no. D'Antonio did not push for a commitment. You know how D'Antonio is. He knows that the kid just decommitted from Virginia Tech, so he told him to take his time. I think D'Antonio knows that they're leading. They got a good shot. Uh, I would put it at uh, confidence meter. I'd put him at 70% Michigan State right now. I'll have to wait and see, but that's the word on him. Quarterback recruiting is always important. I'm trying to find out through Virginia Tech people what they thought about the decommitment, if they thought it was a big loss or not. I'm going to watch some more film of him. Interesting guy. You know, Peyton Thorne, similar, I'd say. So there's like a, 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 a mobile quarterback to elongate plays with a quick release to get rid of it, touch or zip. There's like a, there's a, a typecast there that Michigan State seems to be going over, going after at the quarterback position. And I think he fits into it. Noah Conley, okay, we are over an hour. We're going to try to wrap this up. Noah Conley, fire everyone. I read that. Rob South, what you would call is the most underrated candy bar? I remember when that candy bar first came out in the 70s. They had a big advertising campaign. Remember that? 
Yeah, I'm not going to get into that. You guys are tired of hearing about that. Lodger 91, Grand Rapids, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Have you looked into the UK matchup in the Tournament of Champions yet? It's Champions Classic, man. It's not Tournament of Champions. What's the matter with you? It's funny because uh, Izzo used to call it the Tournament of Champions. And the people that run the tournament had to say, they had, got back to Michigan State, you know, tell Izzo that the name of it is Champions Classic. We're trying to brand this thing. So Izzo's got a little piece of paper now to make sure he gets it right. That's the thing about Izzo. He will listen to people. He will listen to underlings. And if he gets it wrong for them, he feels bad. It's kind of cute. Anyway, I've not looked into the chat, into the matchup yet. I'll be interested to see the guy from Fort Wayne that Michigan State recruited, who he matches up with. But no, I've not looked at it. Because, you know, Kentucky, you can look at it on paper. I can't remember. No, I've not looked into who they have coming back. I heard... I was listening to the podcast, Dockich and uh, Seth Greenberg, and they mentioned something about Kentucky that I meant to make a mental note about it, but I've forgotten it. It was about what they have coming back. I think they're lacking either. They don't usually have, they don't have the point guard they normally would or the big men they normally would. There's something about Kentucky that's not where it, used to, where it is yet. But no, I've not looked into it yet. I apologize. Old Tuck's back to the plate. He's a comp. I do miss the Great Lakes down here. People down in Texas think Austin is a thing of beauty. It isn't. Interesting. Scott Eldridge from Farmington Hills. Quick view on how you thought our Curry played Saturday. Good question. I went back over the game last night, watched every play, and rewound it again, and just watched our Curry. First of all, you know that I thought he played well in the green-white game. I thought he looked the part. And if you got a long look at him this time, if you took a look at him, he's got long arms, big old hams for arms too, long arms. Moved okay. Um, run blocking was excellent. Now, you got to remember also, this was his debut game. This was his Tulsa game. He didn't have a Tulsa game. He got thrown right in there against 99 and 18. And interestingly, the guy that beat him was 26 off the bench or 29. Jason Awa or something like that. And he's a four-star guy too. Probably an NFL guy too. A um, couple of times overset and got beat on counters. And it didn't end up being a sack, but... Maybe gave up a pressure when the quarterback held it a little too long, maybe. Run blocking was a plus. Better at run blocking than Higby. And Higby's an okay run blocker as a tackle. Pass pass sets, I think he's better than Higby at it. Nothing against Higby. But he now, our Curry was beaten twice for sacks. Both of them were loud. One was the Hail Mary at the end of the half. And when they're getting ready for the Hail Mary, you know, Penn State was, they had quarters deep. For like two or three straight plays. And then Michigan State's getting ready for the Hail Mary. Deep. And Penn State's rushing four. The, the play starts. I'm like, Lewerke's not going to have time. By the time To wait for the receivers to get beyond the quarters or to press the quarter fours to, to the goal line, he's not going to have time. And as, and as soon as I got that thought in my head, boom, he didn't have time. It's on the ground. So our Curry missed that one, and he missed another one. So it's one of those deals where I think he graded positively on the vast, vast majority of his plays. But those two were loud ones. You can't have that. You got to... So what he learns there, that's the first time he's... He had 22 career snaps before this. The most plays he'd ever played in a game, the most snaps he'd ever played in a game was like seven. So he's out there trying to play 60 snaps. He went the distance of left tackle. Higby never played. Higby had like a wrap on his arm or something. And Dobbs... Had a parka on even during warm up. I don't think Dobbs was cleared to go for whatever reason. So it was all our Curry. And um, what is he, a junior now? For a guy just starting, just beginning. And he's a guy that I'm sure could probably try to get a sixth year of eligibility if he ever wanted to. 6'7, 307, moves pretty well. He's a junior. Yes, I thought he was solid. And I can see why he had become the left tackle during August camp. Before he was injured, and they would have been, they would have been better on the offensive line, I think, if he would have been in it the whole time, and Higby had been able to come off the bench. Of course, get Jarvis in there, and if Chewins had continued on his trek, maybe they would have been fine at offensive line. But our Curry was solid. We'll see what he looks like next time. I think there's a lot to build on there because physically, looks the part, moves well. I thought he was good. Thought he was solid. Doors fan ninety one. Mark D'Antonio needs to decide by December 1st, like Dorsey said. I heard about Matt's post, but I didn't read it. 
Um, and he later dooms the new coach and the recruiting class. Yeah, so if he wants to decide, I hear what I, I, I heard I, Matt Dorsey posted, I think, that um, he thinks that, that uh, he should step down and the money that's due to him in February negotiated to get that earlier and then hand the baton to a new coach uh, prior to the bowl situation. I could see that, if it, but if D'Antonio, you know, if, he, if the, the flame is starting to flicker out a little bit, and like I said, if he doesn't want to deal with the, with the strain next year, um, that would be the way to do it. Um, if he were my dad, I might suggest that because I wouldn't want to deal with the crap next year. Uh, but D'Antonio is different than we are. He might want to plant that post foot and take it on. And, well, I mean, for the future and all that stuff, they're going to recruit the way they normally recruit anyway. They're going to get those Ohio kids that they get. I don't know. Jack Buckles. If this was already asked, I'm sorry, but I just joined the stream. If this is D'Antonio's last season, who would be an ideal replacement? Um, we talked about it last week also, some of the names I would trot out there. You know, last week I was talking about, well, what if they beat Penn State and win out? And then you, you, you might want to name a replacement from within. That might be more out of the picture now. I think D'Antoni would probably like to go to Mike Tressel, but I'm not sure he's going to have that chance. There was a time when Lloyd Carr would have liked to have handed it off to Herman, but then the defense went sour. Herman left, Carr went sour, and that was all gone. He ended up with Rich Rodriguez and Brady Hoke. And uh, uh, a lot of bad years to the point where they beat Notre Dame and they want to have a parade. All right, so other coaches. I mean, I'd look at the Clawson guy at Wake Forest. He used to coach at Bowling Green. Um, Luke Fickle's the obvious one. I think you open it up nationally just to make sure that there's not somebody that, that want, that's interested in your job that you're not aware of. For instance, when Arkansas had an opening, nobody had an idea that Brett Bielema would be open to go down there. Didn't turn out well, but... You never know when there's going to be, when someone is going to be interested. Like when TCU had the basketball opening, no one knew that Jamie Dixon would be willing to leave Pittsburgh to go down there. That was a great hire for them. So you open it up just to see, I don't know who would be in that category right now. But, you know, Fickle, the timing is good because Fickle has got something good going on at Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is a great... Um, proving ground for a Big Ten job like Michigan State because you're recruiting a lot of the same areas. Michigan State has bumped heads with Cincinnati in recruiting and lost some recruits to Cincinnati. The things they're doing about getting the area of Cincinnati, getting that movement behind Bearcat football, and other coaches have done it too, including D'Antonio, but Cincinnati's always kind of had, kind of had to wait for recruits to trickle down to them. For the first time since I, I can remember, Cincinnati is not waiting for people to trickle down. They're going out and getting... You know, like, what's the guy's name? Jaheim Thomas, Evan Prater, some of these guys. That's impressive, what he's doing in Ohio. To be a football coach at Michigan State, you must recruit Ohio. Must. And that guy's doing it. And he's winning. He was, what was he, 10-2 last year? He's 6-1 and one this year? He was a head coach for an interim basis at Ohio State. Probably learned a lot. Uh, he and D'Antonio, I think they get along fine. I'm sure that that would pass the smell test there. Because Izzo would want to know, what's the deal with this fickle guy? What's up with this guy? And Dan Tony would be like, he's all right. And then that's how things can happen. So um, the, that's the big question. If the timing, is it now? I don't know. Would he be gangbusters? Would he be guaranteed success? No, there's no guaranteed success. I'll go back. Everybody thought Cragthorpe was going to be great at Louisville. You don't even remember who Cragthorpe is. Rich Rodriguez, slam dunk. Just count the national titles. So there's no such thing as a sure thing. You're just looking at guys who have who give you a good chance to get the get the program up to its potential. Um, these are talking points. We're just talking about it. Um, I still think it's up to D'Antonio, but it was it was posed poised well. If if there were an opening, all right, John G. Uh, coach should move to athletic director when he's done coaching. Interesting. I don't know. I, you know, he's, he's, I think he'd like to hang around and do something, but AD is a little too, I don't think he's, I, I think he's, 
He's the guy at the party that goes stand in the corner and just kind of watch people. And, is it time to go yet type of guy? Usually. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But I don't, I don't know if he wants to get into the AD thing. Blong John says, there's no inside info that he is leaving on 10, 20, 28, 19. That's today. There is no inside info. It may be time to bring in a Jeff Thorne to coach quarterbacks, make a run at Warner, the offensive line coach at Michigan, and find a better DB coach. Blong John, would Tim Salem come and coach tight ends? Agree there is some rot on the staff. Interesting words from Blong John, and Blong John knows. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, there he's, D'Antonio is going to plant his post foot and fight back. And he's doing it um, as a competitor, and we'll see what happens. You hope that it doesn't go south on him bad, but again, D'Antonio has won at Michigan State. There's one guy on the planet that's won at Michigan State, and it's not easy to do. He's done it. So if he thinks he's got a recipe and a roadmap how to do it again, not only has he earned it, but the wise thing might be to step back, let him have at it. Let's go to some other questions here. Um, Basketball. How do you see the power forward situation shaking out? That's from Verde Blanco. Also, Verde Blanco asks, uh, who do you project... What do I project about the Langford injury? Could he be out for the year? Yes. Yes, he could be out for the year. Could be out. It's, uh, I heard last winter, a couple of weeks into it, before he was lost for the year, I would heard from sources that um, his ankle was, quote, messed up and might be a career-ending injury. That's what I heard way back then. And I was like, what? Because D'Antonio or Izzo is always like, Oh, we'll see in a couple months. He's on target. He's this and that. But again, he just tells us what he thinks we can handle. Maybe he knew all along he wasn't going to have him. I'm not sure. But, yeah, I think he could be done, sadly. Uh, question, what can we, uh, the power forward position, you know, Thomas Kithier is going to start at the four, I think, tomorrow. See, Kithier plays really well with Tillman. They like that. Secondly, Tillman also can play defense on a five. He's not huge, but he can play defense on a five. So when Tillman sits down, you kind of like to have Kithier in there. So Kithier off the bench makes more sense in some ways. If you can bring him off the bench, let him play a few minutes with Tillman, and then Tillman sits, then Kithier can play the five. Bingham's got all that size, but on offense, he's he's more of a face-up stretch four type of guy because he can shoot the three a little bit. I don't know. You know, Like Izzo said today, none of those guys have separated themselves. Malik Hall has a lot of vertical athleticism. Can shoot okay. He's got some things to learn, but he's tougher and more into it, more mentally focused than I than I had heard that he might be. So that's been a pleasant surprise too. Like Izzo says, there's not been any separation. Izzo always says that the players determine their own playing time, not the coaches. This is one case in which the coaches, the players are not determining it for themselves. So it's on the coach to decide. And there's guys that are strong in some areas and lacking in others, or need to get better in others. So Kithier is one guy that moves well without the ball, knows how to play the game. So he's a guy you finish a game with. Even though he's limited as a scorer, he gets into some open spots and Tillman finds him and he gets shots that way. He's a decent face-up shooter, but he's not a guy you're going to go to. You know, in, Later in his career, he might develop into being a, a guy. Kenny Goins always had a nice shot release, but didn't become a true range shooter until late in his career. Same thing with Adrian Payne. Kithier could become that at some point. But right now he plays good defense, Positional defense away from the ball. All those solid things you need for that glue so that Tillman, Winston, and Aaron Henry can take the shots and be, be the engine. You need the other guys to not give up any leaks. He can do that. In the meantime, Malik Hall's got more ability. Bingham's got upside, but they might be more prone to give up some leaks for now. So that bears watching as we go forward. Not a lot of basketball questions. Basketball tipping off tomorrow, but it's all football. It's where all the hand-wringing is, and I understand it. And um, I, I, my heart goes out to all the fans. You got some good fans out there at Michigan State. You know, going into halftime, I told Conadak, I'm like, man, I was like, man, the fans have done a good job. Showed up pretty good in miserable weather, and we're supporting it. Come out in the second half, everybody left for good reason, because I know it was miserable out there, but um, difficult situation. You know, going, on, going after that game, going over that game yesterday, watching on defense, I'll bet again, like I said after the Ohio State game, when the coaches go over the film, they're going to see a lot of players that played winning football. 
Mike Panashuk was better. Raquan Williams was good. Naquan Jones was better than he was against Wisconsin. Willikus was pretty good. Jacob Panashuk was good. Um, you know, Bocce was Bocce. He was good. Tyree Thompson got banged up a little bit, gave up the one touchdown, but he was taking people on, defeating blocks. They were solid. I mean, Josiah Scott was good. Xavier Henderson was good. Um, what's his name? Josh Butler gave up the play. Shaq Brown came in. Shaq Brown had some rust, had the holding penalty on 4th and 11 because he was getting beat. Got beat another time, tripped the dude. So got off to a slow start, but Shaq Brown was better. Had a good open field tackle once. Open field tackle, Xavier Henderson had a, had a really good one in the flat. Open field tackle on third down. Trey Person had a real good open field in, in the flat tackle on third down. Um, Josh Butler had one on the end of the first drive, I think it was. Open field tackle out in the flat. Good tackle, got him down third down. They gave up 21 points to Penn State. I don't count the Brandon Sowers one. One of them was a short field after the blocked kick. The defense defense was 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 actually a little better. Now I know Ohio State or Penn State possessed the ball too long a few times, punched it in. Michigan State did a good job keeping a lid on Hamler. Hamler's dangerous as heck. Michigan State did a good job against him. Two times deep ball, covered it. On the shallow crossing and go. That was a tough one. Michigan State's playing quarters, shallow cross and go. I mean, quarters when you're when he's going this way and the quarters gets moved out by a receiver. There's there's a vacancy right there and he goes into it. If the quarterback had time, had the mobility to escape, time to throw. That's where the lack of the pack pass rush hurt you a little bit. So how can I say Panashuk and Willick has played well if the pass rush didn't get home? Well, they were good physically on some of the plays against the run. Pass rush has not been as good as it was last year, and that, that's hurt them. Um, but the rest of it, I, you know, it, it's like Antoine Simmons said. They have to stay together and because he's aware of it and Raquan Williams is aware of it, that things can get worse. If they get fractured, the wheels will come off. Because this, this sport, when you get into November, if you don't want to be out there, you'll start losing 40-7 to 7, like that. That could happen to them, but they're not there yet. Um, they need to be aware of that because that could happen. But I think I think they can play some good football. I want to see them working on a dry track. Now, wide receivers, people were asking about uh, what some of these football questions. Okay, Buckeye Sparty asks about Julian Barnett. Didn't play because, as he heard in the first half, because they didn't have C.J. Hayes, and Barnett didn't know how to play outside receiver. To, to Buckeye Spartan, he says that made zero sense to me. Why not keep Stewart in the slot and put Barnett outside to keep him in the field? It's a great question. It's a great question, and I don't know the explanation either, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me either, other than that, that there's logic to every decision that they make, and they thought that it was better to go with Larice Nelson in the slot, Larice Nelson in the slot, and Stewart outside. Maybe, you know, Stewart's their guy. Maybe they thought for whatever reason against the coverages, the outside receiver would be the guy that would be more open more often. Maybe that's what it was. I thought what would be more open is the over routes over the middle to the tight end or slot receiver. So maybe Stewart would have been better in, in that regard. I'm not as a slot. You put your best receiver in the slot. I don't know. So Larice Nelson gets hurt, and then Sowards comes in. And Sowards has caught the one out of bounds. You know, Lewerke missed two or three times trying to throw a back shoulder. And back shoulder was getting away from him. That's one throw he doesn't throw very well. Maybe that was... I, I can't even remember other games if he's thrown it or not. The rain thing was a factor for Lewerke. For a guy that really wanted to get back into a rhythm, that didn't help. I know it was the same for Clifford, and Clifford's numbers were about the same as Lewerke's. Illinois against Purdue. See how many times Illinois threw the ball against Purdue? Same rain going on there. Rain, 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 rain. Illinois' quarterback threw the ball six times against Purdue. Six. Purdue threw it like 30 because they were losing the whole game. If you can run the ball in the rain and they can't stop it, they got a problem, right? Notre Dame, problem. Purdue, problem. So um, so when Larice Nelson got hurt, Sowards went in, and we know Sowards, you know, he is what he is. So I agree. It, 
And by that time, then Stewart was out, then Barnett is in, and Trey Mosley were in, and they both did pretty well, right? So Trey Mosley was the best slot receiver of the day that I saw. And that was, that was, I mean, he was making some difficult plays in traffic, getting bumped, holding on to it. One of them, I think, was a third down conversion. That was solid. No question about it. Um, uh, you know, a question, I didn't say who this was from, but he says a lot has been, a lot has been said about some coaches being weak recruiters or even non-recruiters. Can you give us a sense of which coaches are carrying the recruiting load? Also, which coaches do a better job of evaluation? And do we even keep track of this? Evaluation. Well, let's see. All right, in terms of raw recruiting, you know, Terry Samuel is kind of up and down. He was a guy that was supposed to be your, you put one of your better recruiters in the Detroit area, and they've been up and down in Detroit, mostly down in recent years, right? But he goes down to Georgia and, and gets the commitment from Jordan Simmons. Now Simmons, the running back from Georgia, visited LSU this weekend, and his father said probably have some visits to West Virginia and Auburn coming up. So it's a commitment, but they were planning to do other visits in the meantime. I don't think LSU has offered yet, so there's st still more recruiting to do there. But credit Terry Samuel for getting Jordan Simmons to come to Michigan State's camp in the summer, come back for an official visit, and get a commitment. Um, Samuel kind of kind of runs hot and cold. It's like there's some recruits that he really can tune in with, but in terms of the blanket recruiting, haven't really seen it over the years. You know, Brad Salem did a really good job in the Chicago area, suburban Detroit in the past, but now that he's offensive coordinator, does that entail more work? In the winter and the spring, would he not be able to be entrusted to handle those two important recruiting areas? Now, he, he tag-teamed Chicago with Ron Burton. Ron Burton's been a really good recruiter over the years. So Burton would be one. This year, I don't know if we've seen Ron Burton ring the bell yet, but in the past, he's been a real good one. Mark Staten was a good recruiter in the past. Now that he's not the offensive line coach anymore, is he involved in offensive line recruiting as much? Not that I can see. So that's someone who was a, a good young recruiter in the past. Um, did that change with his change in job? I'm not sure. We'll have to wait and see. In the Detroit area, you know, this year, this winter, Michigan State was slow on some recruits. Guys like Enzo Jennings and Braden McGregor, slow. I talked to Braden McGregor at a camp. You know, he was interested in Michigan State. He committed to Michigan, but he flat out told me he hadn't heard from Michigan State. That's when Michigan State was changing recruits changing assistant coaches and when those changes were going taking place there was some slippage there in some recruiting areas so we gotta get back after that you know right now you know dave warner um dave warner was the initial recruiter for ian stewart who's a good in-state recruit that they didn't they weren't slow on they got him and Stewart tells me now that, that Treadwell is the coach that talks to him the most. But Warner, I think Warner brought in Kyle King out of Indiana, who I thought was a good recruit. I think he's underrated. Indiana guy, I think that, that'll prove to be good evaluation there. Um, in terms of poor evaluation, look at the wide receiver position. You know, Javez Alexander, we haven't seen him on the field yet. Um, you know, Kyle Carrick is a guy that came in as a wide receiver, didn't last long. I think that was a Dave Warner recruit. You know, everybody's had hits and misses. You know, offensive line, you've had guys not pan out. That's what, you know, Mark Staten was the offensive line coach. But if Chewins is healthy and Jarvis is healthy and our Curry's healthy, does that look different? Because he was also in charge of, you know, bringing in Conklin. Now, Roshar recruited the first, recruited Jack, Jack Allen. So, I don't know. It's you know they've won a lot of games in the past. These same guys. It's not like they've forgotten anything. But some of these other guys, in terms of who are the top recruiters, you know these guys that they've gotten like Angelo Gross and Jeff Piotrowski, Chris Mayfield. They beat what Purdue and Minnesota for Mayfield. But a lot of these guys, they haven't been like real hardcore recruiting battles. So a lot of those are just Michigan State deciding. Yeah, we're gonna go after this guy like Angelo Gross or Piotrowski. You know, Tressel's been in there. If there's something going on in Ohio, he usually has a hand in it. In the past, um, was he considered a strong recruiter in Ohio or more of a, a Judd Heathcote evaluator type of guy? I don't know. He, he was responsible for going ahead and getting Le'Veon Bell and some others. So everybody's had hits and misses. Across the board, 
It's not like they have elephant hunters. You all know that. But it's not like they've got guys, in my opinion, that are just like sleeping on the couch earning a paycheck. They're just kind of all... Right now, I think they're all kind of like not at, not at what they would call championship level. They grade themselves as championship level players, the coaches, and the coaches on the practice field. I, you know, I could be wrong. I don't, I mean, they're also trying to recruit clean. So going down to, down south and recruiting clean, not easy. In Detroit with some guys, not easy. So easy for me here, sitting here eating donuts, drinking coffee to talk about who's not doing a good job when my job is this easy, hanging out with you guys. But I apologize to any Michigan State coaches that are watching, but they asked a question. That's that's what I'm seeing right now. Maybe they'll rally. Uh, I think Elante Brown's going to end up a Spartan. And think about Elante Brown. I was just texting with him a minute ago. I got to get some more back to him. What is it? Eleven o'clock now. It's probably too late now. Um, you know, explosive guy, high school quarterback, explosive. Think about Anthony Williams. They brought Anthony Williams in. They like him. They've been pleasantly surprised with his athleticism. He's gotten on the field and played some pretty good Big Ten football this year. He's been okay. Not like a difference maker breakthrough guy, but true freshman on the field. He's got some He's got some ability. Dropped a pass on Saturday. Needs to catch that. We all know that. But what Anthony Williams is, Elante Brown was like a better version of that, they thought, last year. So that's what, if you're thinking about Elante Brown, consider that. Um Okay, so Martian Mambo out of Mason, Michigan posted. He says, I believe Coach D is not going anywhere, and he will be the head coach for some time. I also believe we will see major turnover on the staff. If I'm right, what are your percentages for the number of coaches replaced? Like 50% chance that three are replaced, 70% chance that two are. I think that's his prediction. I I wouldn't be surprised if it were something like that. 50% chance that three get replaced wouldn't surprise me. A lot of people are like, you're crazy. He didn't replace them next year. He's not going to do it this year. I've been hearing some rumblings that, that I mean, you know, his his reputation's on the line. He knows that. Would rather not do it, but I think that could happen. All right, Spartan on 6686 says, any younger coaches, uh, on younger coaches, he says, any possibility of Blake Treadwell coming in to coach offensive line? He's co- currently the running backs coach at Bucknell. No, that would be too quick of a jump, I think, for right now. Offensive line coach is a very... And he was, Blake Treadwell's a good coach, a good player, has been in GA. Someday he could definitely be an offensive line coach. But he's going to have to work his way up a little bit more, go to the MAC level. He's not ready yet, I wouldn't think. And Powell, 8224, says, In the VCast, you said Josiah Scott is still NFL bound after this year. He's a junior. Uh, I and many MSU fans don't see it. He has not lived up to the preseason hype. I disagree. I think he's been good. And he's shown more straight line speed than, uh, than I knew he had. He got beat on that one with Hamler, but third and five, two-way go. Hamler is exceptional at that. Like I said, there's NFL people that would not cover him, and Josiah Scott, I think, is an NFL slot corner. From Flushing, Michigan, I didn't get his name. He says, Trey Mosley looked really good uh, making some tough grabs in this past game. Two questions. Where has he been all year? And two, do you see him in the playing group going forward regardless of preserving a redshirt status? Great question. Where's he been all year waiting his turn? Sometimes they get in and they turn it on, right? And that's what happened there. D'Antonio's been saying for a few weeks that he's been on the cusp, on the cusp, got in there and did well. So preserving the red shirt, I don't think it happens. I think you play him the rest of the year. There's a chance if he sits two more games, if you go to a bowl game, you can preserve the red shirt. Against Illinois, they have to win. I think he's going to be on the field. There's some rumors that Daryl Stewart might be out. Uh, Mike Valeni, I think, said that on his on his show that he's hearing that that Stewart's out for the season. I've not heard that, but Valeni usually doesn't say something like that unless he has it from a good source. So I don't doubt it. That would be that would be costly. You know, Stewart's been their best receiver. He's had some drops. He's not perfect. I don't think he is the consummate number one Michigan State receiver, but um, that would be costly. As a matter of fact, my last question comes from a guy named Sparty. Oh, he's from Lake Orion, Michigan. He says there are rumors that Daryl Stewart being done for the year. Have you heard anything? I just answered that question. All right, let's go back here and wrap it up. What do we have? I got to re- I got to back this up here. Let's see, Doors fan. What young coaches would uproot to MSU if Coach D plans to stick around a few more seasons? 
it is being used against them on the recruiting trail. <clears throat> um, young coaches, there's coaches that will uproot and go if they can coach at Michigan State. Um, good point, though. It's not like you're going to go out and get I know. Could you make a run at Warner at Michigan? Oh, man, that'd be weird, wouldn't it? Offensive line coach at Michigan, Warner. His son plays at Michigan State right now. And he and D'Antonio have known each other a long time. Um, I don't know. Uh, in, in that profession, people leave. Sometimes you sometimes you're in, and you see surprising things. I can't think of a good answer to that right now. Jay Truth says, We just played potentially three of the best teams in the country. Clearly, we're not as good as we hoped. But is it possible we're not as bad as what it, as what it's looked? Jay Truth, I think you're speaking the truth. I think there's definitely a chance that of that, especially if Michigan State can remain confident, remain positive, like the coaches and players are talking about, getting it recollected, all those cliches, give the best version of yourself in the games going forward. And yes, they can be difficult to beat. Michigan State can. As long as they don't start second-guessing and pointing fingers. I know those are cliches, but on an 85-man team, you need that. And, yeah, those three, uh, like I said on the huge show today, Michigan State was blown out at Wisconsin. 99% of the teams in the country, if they had to play at Ohio State at Wisconsin, they would have gotten blown out at Wisconsin that day. Especially if they gave as much effort at Ohio State as Michigan State did and took the abuse that they did coming back the next week against that team on that day when Ohio, when Wisconsin was just rested and ready. The way their schedule went, they were primed for a, a very physical, efficient, strong game on that day. And Michigan State happened to be the team there that day, and they happened to be coming directly from Columbus. Um, like I said, maybe LSU would have avoided an upset that day in, in Camp Randall if they'd have played back-to-back. Maybe Alabama, maybe Clemson. Maybe not. Uh, maybe you know three or four or five teams. Michigan State went there, looked terrible. A lot of te- everybody would have looked terrible that day. So I think you're exactly right. Michigan State looked good at times against Ohio State. That doesn't get you anything. But again, I go back to what I said after that day. There's a good team in there somewhere, I think, because they looked good at times against Ohio State. You got to do it for 60 minutes. I understand that. So that's why the Penn State game was so crucial, so important. And oh, uh, I, I, it's a is a spoiled specimen a little a little bit because, I mean, you were there probably. It's hard to throw a football there when that r- blowing rain is going on. Can't run the ball that great against the number one rush defense in the country. Hard to look good. I think there's a chance they're not as bad as they look. And they look terrible. So <laughs> by saying they're not as bad as they look, okay, good. In the last three weeks, they've looked like the worst team in the country, right? So is there a good chance they're not actually the worst team in the country? Very good chance that they're not the worst team in the country. But a chance that they're, uh, I don't know, I said three weeks ago that they would end, the loser of the Michigan-Michigan State game would end up 7-5. and five. Now maybe the loser might end up being 7-5. and five. I don't know. Bradley Cruz, enjoy watching the vids. Thanks, Bradley. Hey, make sure to go down and, and like the video and become a subscriber. That's what they say on these YouTube channels. I don't know. If you, if you, if you haven't already. Yeah, give us a like, give us, uh, and, and subscribe. Uh, oh, Bradley, just giving compliments, thanks. J Truth, talent, or at least depth, is clearly not at Ohio State, Wisconsin, Penn State level, correct? What Jim seems to be getting at is, let's see what happens against the rest of the schedule. Thanks, I needed an interpreter there. Noah Conley, fun fact, I'm a sophomore at Michigan State, and Devontae Dobbs follows me on Instagram. My other question is, why hasn't Michigan State started Dobbs? He's a five-star recruit, for crying out loud. Um, Dobbs was injured this weekend. You can ask him about that. At least he looked like it, because he had a parka on, and he looked, he was not active. Um, I think that they are preserving his red shirt still. He hasn't started. He's not quite as good as Higby yet. And he's not as good as our Curry yet. So he's been the next man in. Not this game, but the previous games. He was on alert and ready to go in if needed. He's played, what, one game? Maybe two? I'd have to look into that. So, like D'Antonio says, if you're only going to play five or ten snaps, then and you're only gonna, and you're only then, then they don't want to blow your red shirt. So he's probably good enough to give them five snaps, but they'd rather not blow a red shirt on that. So that's why. He's, he's not starting because he's not as good 
as Higby yet, and not as good as our Curry. Our Curry was pretty solid. But Dobbs, um, you know, the pass set needs to improve. He needs to get quicker with the lateral movement. He's got the wheels to do it, but that's the way it is. Uh, Doors fan, took your advice and bought rain pants last year. How'd it work out for you? Key, right? Because when you sit down and it rains, you just, oh, I got my rain jacket. I'll be okay. Then you sit down and your, your legs get wet. That's miserable. Rain pants. Makes a rain game much more doable. So Doors fan, did you did so did, did it work out for you? Were you there all four quarters? It's a, it's a big deal, right? Rain pants. Rain pants. They should sell those at the game. Situation like that. Game ball for the rain pants. Who knew? Makes sense, right? I don't know. I mean, I'm watching people go to the game. You, you saw the VCast last year. I'm, it's going to rain at the game. You're watching people go to the game. I'm like, people, why don't you have rain pants on? And you'll see like one out of every 30 guys has a rain pants on. Like, that guy knows what he's doing. All right. Wish Nike had a good MSU waterproof coat. Todd H. Cody White had 66 yards with only three catches. Why are we not throwing to him more? That's, that was Cody White's best game of the year. And... Like I said in the VCast, if you'd had that Cody White against Arizona State, you might win the game. Probably do. He's been a little bit, a little bit flaky this year. I don't mean personally. I just mean production-wise. He was good. He had a that tippy toe catch along the sideline was great. Took a hit later to make a play. So could they have thrown to him more? I think they. You know, I'd have to look to see how much they targeted him. But I know some of those poor. Uh, errant, inaccurate passes were to him. I'm going to look it up right now, if you, if you don't mind. I'll look to see how much he was targeted. I can get that information right now. This is when I would turn it over to my co-host. I don't have a co-host today, so this is going to take me about 55 seconds. Now, let me look at another question here. i got to put NCAA in here. Dead air, dead air. Too bad I can't press a button and go to the news break. Right? Um, let me go back to a question here while I do that. King Williams says, I played with Devontae Dobbs at Belleville. He will be the hardest working offensive lineman. Dude's a beast with a high motor. They need to play Julian Barnett a lot more. Too good with the ball in his hands. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. That was strange that Barnett wasn't playing earlier. And Davion Williams, I would have expected him to get in there at some point. Belleville's playing Celine this weekend in the playoffs. I looked into going to that game. Also, I looked into going to the Muskegon game over in Grand Haven. And I'm not going to be able to do either. Anybody out there, if you know anyone that wants to do uh, freelance high school recruiting coverage, send me an email. Comp at Global. Dot net Jim Comp at SBC Global dot net. Let's see, teams looking up the looking up how many times he was targeted. This is my ADD. I start looking at, look, I get interested in something, I, I, I can't stand it. I got to look, look it up to see what the numbers were because I think that he was targeted quite a bit. Now, why is this now? Let's go back to the questions. This is quality viewing, isn't it? We're just all hanging around. Just a fireside chat. It's going to be that time of year. You turn, get the fire, put another log in the fire. We're just sitting around talking Michigan State football. Noah Conley, uh, agree with so much King Williams says. <clears throat> I think Dobbs will end up in the NFL. Might be a guard. That level. Could happen. What is going on here? Big disappointment that I can't find this quicker. All right, here's week nine. That was week nine we just saw, right? This is not going to earn me any Emmys. Offensive grades. Oh, I know we want targets. No Emmys for SpartanMag.com. Receiving grades. Cody White, targets. Cody White was targeted more than anybody on the team. Seven targets. Dotson had six. Elijah Collins, six. Trey Mosley, five. Seibert, three. Julian Barnett, three. Trenton Gillison, two. Larice Nelson, two. Daryl Stewart, only two. 
Brandon Sowards to Rosenthal one. So Cody White, you make the point that he, he needs to get the ball more. They targeted him more than anybody. They threw it 39 times in the rain. So he was targeted, had three catches. So there's the answer for that. I hope that that makes you feel a little bit better that at least they were looking at him, looking at him. And Cody White came to play that day. He did well. All right. Rain Pants earned a game ball, Dorsen, and bought Marmot Brand from Moose Jaw. East Lansing Moose Jaw? Or Ann Arbor Moose Jaw? Maybe we should get them as an advertiser. Doors fan, why don't you go over to Moose Jaw and sell an ad for me over there? They can Moose Jaw, this could be the Moose Jaw Spartan Mag Live. We can do this over there at the Moose Jaw. Okay? Yes, East Lansing. Okay, there you go. All right, Brian B. Noticed Cody went. Without gloves Saturday seemed to help him hold on to the ball better. You know, some people in the rain like gloves, some people don't. I don't know what all the gloves thing is. I missed the memo on all the glove talk this year with the receivers. I I know there's some talk about it, and I don't know what it is, so I'm not going to comment. I don't know what if it's good or bad or what's going on there. It must have happened on some Twitter thread that I didn't see because I don't, or maybe on the underground bunker message board I didn't see it. Anyway, Todd H, could you check Cody's targets and catches ratio for the year? I would bet big money he has the fewest drops per catchable ball than anyone else on the team. Um, I don't think I don't know if I've got that in terms of catchable ball percentage. Um, yeah, I I, have to, I don't even know if I've got that. It might be in here. I've got the Pro Football Focus database. I've got access to it, but I don't I don't have that right now. Um, drops, Cody. In terms of drops, Cody White ranked number four in receiving hands. They gave him a 62.4 on a 100 scale. So they had Rosenthal ahead of him. Rosenthal one for one caught the one that was thrown to him. And that one was not easy on that third and two out in the flat, bluff route to the flat. I don't know why they give him a 79 because he had one thrown to him, but he grades out at 79. I guess they judge how difficult it was. I don't know. They had Seibert at 66, Trey Mosley at 65, Cody White at 62. So that's just for that game. For the year, I've got that somewhere. But I'm not going to bore you guys and look that up. I think that's it. Like Rick Nash coming in. I get nervous every time the ball is passed to Cody. He has been average. Correct. I would agree with that. He's been average, but he was better than average in this game. That was a step up. Now Trey Mosley looks good. Barnett got to get him going a little bit more. Seibert got banged up a little bit. We'll have to wait and see. Where he's going to be, we will have no inside information on how he's going to be prior to the game. Um, but now that Seibert's gone, I mean, I don't know that he's gone. That was a slip. But if is if he is gone, um, believe me, I don't know that he's gone. That was not a Freudian slip. I don't have any inside information on him. But could that make the Noah Davis defection that much more hurtful? It's possible. Anyway, that's been more than an hour and a half. I apologize it went so long, but you guys are crazy enough to hang out. And I'm crazy enough to talk with you guys. Had a good time. Um, make sure to subscribe and like it and tell, it, tell your friends and enemies. Bring them back. Tell Moose Jaw we were talking about them. And we'll see you next Monday night. Might go to 930 because my daughter has basketball practice every Monday. And I like to go watch a little bit. And we might have to do this at 930. Appreciate everybody being flexible, doing it this weekend. My name is Jim Comperoni, publisher of SpartanMag.com. Thanks for hanging out. We will see you Tuesday night at Breslin, Michigan State versus Albion. And we'll see you here on Spartan Mag Live next Monday. In the meantime, we'll have the VCast Tuesday night from Breslin Center and probably a skull session with Big Movie this week. And we've got some recruiting coverage too. We'll find out what's going with that. Basketball too. We'll find out which recruits were at Midnight Madness. Still trying to track that down. Jim Comperoy, publisher of SpartanMag.com. Thanks for hanging out.